This is called No Cross, No Christ. Psalm 34. The Lord is near to them that are of a broken heart, and He saves such as be of a contrite spirit. <clears throat> the Lord is near to them that are of a broken heart. You know, when we think of a broken heart, we imagine it belonging to someone who's grieving over the loss of one that they loved. Um, it's not what David is prophetically speaking about here. It's a, the word near has to do, literally, the Lord is near to them, or nigh in the King James, but the Lord is near to them. It has to do with God's present presence. God's present presence is very close. God is very attracted to those who are of a broken heart. Let me ask you this question. How many have ever experienced a broken heart? Right? How many remember the feeling of terrible hopelessness and despair that comes during that season? It's literally a... There's something that happens physically. I, I, when my brother died, um, for a year I had pains in my heart. And then when my good friend died several months ago, it was the same way. And it's literally something happens in your heart. And, it's, and, and they call it a broken heart, and I understand why they call it that. <clears throat> but there's such a feeling of terrible hopelessness and despair that comes during the season of a broken heart. The Bible says when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, they came home and they told his father Jacob that he was dead. In Genesis 37, it says all the sons and daughters came to comfort Jacob, but he refused to be comforted. No, I shall continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. And the Bible says, and he continued to weep. This kind of brokenness feels like you'll never recover. But amazingly, over time, the pain begins to lessen. But David wrote here in Psalm that God's present presence is near to them. And then he uses the words that are of a broken heart. The words are of has to do with where you live. It has to do with where you remain, where you abide, or where you dwell. How many are thankful that the initial pain from a loss eventually begins to subside? You know, if it didn't, we would physically die before long. But David said that there's a broken-hearted location where you can live continually close to the presence of God. The brokenhearted translates the place where the self is quenched and subdued and overcome. Look at the next verse in verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The word many afflictions have to do, it's the Hebrew word ra. It means many are the distresses and the calamities and the adversity and the trouble and the sorrow and the misery and the affliction and it also means unfair treatment. How many hate unfair treatment? The Bible says that that's one of the things that happens to the righteous. Unfair treatment. It also means to punish, to discipline. Many afflictions. How many would be much happier if it said very few? Or almost none? Many. The word many literally translates increasing. It means multiplying. It means coming more often. Let me ask you this. What if the only proof that you're walking the path of righteousness is that trouble's increasing? What if deleting suffering from the walk of the believer is literally just removing the believer from the righteous way? Look at John 16 and 33. These things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Jesus said this, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. In the world you'll have tribulation. The word literally again, it's just like David said. It means suffering, it means trouble, and it means anguish. Anguish has to do, do with severe mental, emotional, or physical distress and suffering. Jesus said this, this in, uh, in John. He said, while you live in this world, you will experience affliction. It literally translates this. While you are in this world, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you'll have to suffer. That's what he said. You have to suffer. 
Then he says these words, and this word always confused me, but be of good cheer. Don't worry, be happy. I always thought that's what it meant. How many think when cheer, you think that means just be happy? <laughs> it's even worse than that. Jesus didn't just say, just be happy. Be of good cheer literally translates, have courage, be brave. Have courage, be brave. The word courage is strength in the face of pain or grief. When Jesus tells you to be brave, how unnerving is that? Just be brave. I don't want to be brave. How many don't want to have to be in a situation where you've got to be brave? You don't really want to have to face any be courageous situations in life. How many would rather just be comfortable? If Jesus had said, be comfortable, it's going to be all right. Just take it easy. But he didn't. He said, be brave. Luke 9, 23. And he said to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. How many know these words came from Jesus? How many would be offended if I preach about this? How many know I didn't say it? I didn't even write it. You know, when Daniel was a little boy, I bought him this little wooden workbench. <clears throat> and it had, in this bench, there were holes in series all through the top of this bench. And it had this little wooden hammer. And he would take this hammer and he would drive these little wooden pegs through the holes in the bench. How many remember those? I think Judah might even have had one too. It mimicked carpentry. And so he could pretend to do what his daddy did in real life, like a junior carpentry. You know, he's this little wee guy just hammering away. We're so proud of him. <laughs> you know, Christianity has in our generation created the exact same scenario. How many have ever read uh, where Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he became sin who knew no sin that we may become the righteousness of God in him. How many ever read that verse? You know, when I was young, there was a group called the Oak Ridge Boys. How many remember them? They used to sing a song and it said this, I was guilty with nothing to say. And they were coming to take me away. But then a voice from heaven was heard that said, let him go and take me instead. And then it went on to say, and I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on a cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's son, took my place. How many heard that before? So when we read this verse in Luke chapter nine, our modern day Christian mentality, when Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and..." Follow me. So when we read this verse, our modern day Christian mentality is, so Jesus hung on a real cross so I could have a pretend one. Jesus suffered real suffering so that mine could just, you know, just be everyday annoyances. So we've created a crossless generation that has no need to take courage. How many know if you were going to a real cross, it would take some courage? What a horrifying thought. I was listening to a preacher preach on the cross this week. One of the things I didn't realize, and he had proved in the Greek, how when Jesus and, and, the, and, and the men who hung on the cross, when those who hung on the cross were crucified, they weren't hung very far off the ground. We always think of them hanging way up out of everyone's reach, but they were hung low enough that people could abuse them. Isn't that even a, a greater horror to the cross? Jesus, so Jesus hung on this real cross, but I have this, this make-believe, this pretend cross that as a Christian that I bear daily. We have an imaginary cross scenario created by a fearful, cowardly generation. And I'm ashamed of that. Luke 9, 24, next verse. 
Jesus said, for whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Whosoever will. Notice that word, will. The word will here is a word, it's a Greek word. It means not just desire, like from my will, but it literally is a word, intention. Now, Jesus said that whoever has the intention to save, rescue, heal, or preserve his natural existence. There are two words that are translated in the English as intention, one with T-I-O-N and the other is intention with S-I-O-N. This intention when, what is the word will is the word uh, T-I-O-N and it comes from a Greek word and it's going to shock you because it shocked me when I read it. And it means the object for which prayer is offered. That's what he said. Whosoever has a, an object, a natural object that they offer prayer for, shall lose it. I didn't make any of this up. I just read it. Look at Luke 12, 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people in so much that they trod one upon another, he began to say to the disciples, first of all, beware of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Here Jesus is giving a warning to the church. How many know that he's talking uh, to his disciples? How many are the disciples of Christ? How many are followers of Jesus Christ? So he's talking to you. He's talking to us. He's talking to disciples. This is prophetically Jesus declaring something that lasts for all times. And he said this warning to the church. Beware of the leaven, which he told them later was the doctrine of the Pharisees. He refers to their doctrine as leaven. Why? Leaven creates gas bubbles that lighten and soften what's added to it. It causes the dough to quickly expand by changing its original consistency to a whole other form. It adds something that softens it. Jesus said, beware of that which softens the message. Beware of that which takes away from the message. Beware of that which causes it to consistently change from its original form. He said, this fast spreading doctrine, he's telling the church, is one of hypocrisy. It's a form that spreads quickly because it's very attractive to the soul. It's attractive to myself, my soulish part. It's a form that spreads like leaven. We have a multitude of these doctrines in this entitled generation. The gospel doesn't sound like it did. The gospel doesn't sound like it used to. Not even when I was a small child and I can remember people going to the altar and weeping, crying out for the presence of God to come, begging the Lord to come, forgive them, pardon them, wash them in the blood. I remember those days. But this slowly over time, something's been removed. I don't know if you've noticed it. It sneaks in slowly, almost like socialism into a government. Slowly we embrace it again. We embrace something else. Why? It's easier. It's easier. I don't have to have courage to do this anymore. I don't really have to be brave to do this anymore. He said the doctrine of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. The word hypocrisy is pretense. The doctrine of the Pharisees always creates a crossless religion. Always. I just saw where, there, I was just telling my mom and dad about it, I just saw where the new, the, the, the Pope that's in, in the Vatican now has declared the new world religion, the one world religion, and it's called Chrislam. He came together with the leader of the Islamic nation and the Pope, and they declared one world religion, and it's called Chrislam. And you're going to see it spread all over the world. And February 4th, they celebrate it. And they snuck it in, and it's now become a holiday. On February 4th, they celebrate Chrislam in this nation and all over the world. How did it happen? You didn't see it. Nobody announced it. It comes in quietly and slowly. And slowly over time, people will say, we've got to embrace them as believers, as loving people. We've got to embrace them. A crossless religion. 
The doctrine of the Pharisees always has a crossless religion. Now, listen, in Christianity, we will never delete Jesus' cross. Why? Because we believe uh, in Jesus' cross strongly. Why? Again, because it's our get-out-of-hell-free card. As long as I cling to the old rugged cross of Christ and don't let go, I know that I have a place in heaven. But the cross that Jesus called me to take up daily, what about that cross? It merely becomes symbolic. It's just a symbol of something that's not even real. He said, take up. Take up your cross. The word take up doesn't mean to pick it up and carry it. It means to yield the self and all of its desires. That's what he said. Take up the cross. Yield the self. What does your self desire? I don't even have to know you or talk to you at length, and I know what your self desires. Confident security. That's what every self desires. Confident security. How many get nervous when your bank account goes down? That's all you got to look at, right? How many get nervous when, when the world runs out of toilet paper? <laughs> right? How many have stacked up toilet paper since the last time? It won't be toilet paper next time. It'll be something else. Macaroni and cheese. <laughs> right? It's always something, something to shock you, something to surprise you. We want confident security, don't we? Because we're insecure in this world. We don't like when people close to us die because then we always feel like we're next. Right? There's something about us. We just want to continually be confident. The more money we have, the further we can keep dead away. The wolf goes further away from the door. We want confident security. Confident security is the desperate desire of the souls of all humanity. Look at Luke 23. <clears throat> There were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. They were come to the place which is called Calvary. And there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they parted his raiment and they cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, doesn't, don't you fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing, has done nothing amiss. And he said Jesus, unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. <clears throat> A couple weeks ago we read a scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2 where Peter wrote, here is your call. Christ suffered as an example for you to follow in his steps. How many remember that? How many deleted that? The word suffer means to experience pain. So here in Luke, we see Jesus experiencing the pain and the absolute suffering of his cross. The word excruciating, how many have ever heard that word excruciating? It translates intense suffering with agonizing pain. It, it, the word excruciating actually is a Latin word that comes uh, from the meaning out of the cross, excruciating, out of the cross. The pain was so terrible they couldn't even, they, they had to make up a word just for the cross. And Jesus is crucified here, Luke tells us, with two others. Matthew says there was one on his right and one on his left. Parabolically, allegorically, they represent the soul and the spirit. You have to see it in the spirit. Look at verse 35 again. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with him derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. 
if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. Here we see the Pharisees spreading their doctrine. They derided him, translates, they mocked him greatly. If you're anointed and chosen and highly favored by God, use your mountain moving, moving faith to save yourself. You know, it's amazing about our generation. I've heard people talking about using their faith to get good parking spaces at Walmart. I've heard preachers preach that. If that's not the leaven of the Pharisees, I'm not sure what would be. We've effectively created doctrines that not only deleted the cross that we were called to, but we've embarrassingly taken it to an extreme where we believe for all of life's inconveniences just to be removed. Today's Pharisees still stand at the foot of your cross shouting, where's your faith? I was looking on a Christian website the other day for a testimony that I heard about. Somebody told me about a testimony that I needed to see, so I looked on this website. I had to navigate through a minefield of financial requests just to find this prophecy on this website. Literally, I didn't think unless I donated, they would even allow me in. It was that hard to navigate through the, through the site. And then I thought about it, and I, here's my thought, because this was a faith ministry that I was navigating through. If faith ministries have such great faith that they can heal the sick, raise the dead, and evacuate demons, why don't they have enough faith for money without asking me for mine? Just saying. Let me ask you this. When you stand before the Lord to be judged, what if he asks you, where's your cross? What did you bring with you? Where's your cross? What are you going to say? I quoted Mark eleven twenty three 23 until it was gone. I quoted faith scriptures till, till it was gone. Why did you do that? And you'll say, well, I felt mocked by the Pharisees' doctrine for my lack of faith. So here's the Pharisees with their doctrine mocking the one on the cross. Why don't you come down, great faith man? You heal the sick, you raise the dead, you cast out devils, you can't get off the cross. Look at verses 36 and 37. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, offering him vinegar, and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. The soldiers represent the heathen world. How many have ever heard the saying, as the church goes, so goes the world? How many wonder why the church, or why the world is becoming so mocking and dishonorable? They just, it's, they follow the leader. They just follow the, the, the leader. And the church is called to be the leader. And so they just follow the mocking voice of the church. They joined their voices with the Pharisees, didn't they? They heard the church standing there mocking the Christ, hanging on the cross, and they begin to just join in. If you're such a good Christian and you're so highly favored, then why is your loving God giving you that cross to die on? Look at verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. This man represents your soul. This man represents the soul of every believer. You like to think of him as some, the bad guy that you're you know, separated from, that you have no part of, but this is the side of you that hates the cross and hates the suffering of the cross. The soul despises every form of struggle. I preached a sermon the other day at a, a funeral for a 21-year-old girl. And nobody there knew the Lord. Carol and I and, and one friend of mine that went along. The girl was a, a Wiccan. And I preached a sermon on how you were born to struggle. And how from the very beginning, that's your call. How many have ever watched a baby struggle? struggle to 
walk, struggle to over and over, falling down, falling down, falling down. They start out struggling, don't they? Struggling for food. The primal cry of that child is just a cry to live. They finally learn to roll over and you're so proud of them. Finally learn to walk after so many failures. So many failures. They're so determined though, aren't they? They never give up. They're just so determined. They refuse to relent. So what happens when you get old? Why do we quit struggling? Why do we look for the path of least resistance? Why did we desire that path of least resistance so much? God created you to struggle forward. That's where life is. Life is in the struggle. As soon as the struggle leaves, the life leaves. This man represents my soul. He despises every form of suffering and struggle. Why? One reason is that my soul is still driven by pride. Weakness and pride don't mix. I don't like people to think I'm weak. Not me, I'll stand in front of a crowd and ball, I don't care. Yeah. So my soul quickly adopts the doctrine of the Pharisees because the doctrine of the Pharisees is very self-preserving and it's crossless. It doesn't cost me anything. All I got to do is say, Jesus, be my Savior, and the rest is just given to me. Look at Matthew 16. From that time forward, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And he turned and said unto Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. For you don't savor the things that be of God, but those that be of men. How many would have hated to have been Peter in this point? Poor Peter. How many understand that if, G if Satan temp attempted to tempt even Jesus himself with a Pharisee's doctrine, a crossless religion, that he's going to tempt you with the same thing? How many understand that if Jesus was tempted by it, you'll be tempted by it, right? We will. Remember, Peter represents the way of the church, doesn't he? Prophetically, the voice promoting a crossless and self-preserving religion is still crying out loud and clear 2,000 years later. Jesus was and is still offended by the doctrine of the Pharisees. When he said, you're an offense to me, Jesus was offended then and he's offended today by the same doctrine. It's a doctrine of devils. He says that crossless Christianity savorest not the things of God. How many use the word savorest a lot? Thou savorest not. How many would like to know what the word savorest even means? How many thinks of, think of steak when you hear the word savorest? I do. It's the Greek word phreneo. It means no understanding and no interest. The carnal soul has no interest in the ways of God. That's what Jesus said. The soul has no interest in the way of God. Its focus is on the way of the natural realm. That's what he said, the ways of man, the ways of the natural realm, confidence, security. When I look up at the broken body of Jesus, hanging on the cross of Calvary, my soul has no interest in joining him there. You will never hear a 21st century believer saying, singing the words, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like him on Good Friday. So again, in Luke chapter 23, we have the religious church mocking the crucified Christ. We have the world 
mocking the crucified Christ. Look at verses 39 and 40 again. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God, seeing that you're in the same condemnation? So again, the soul cries out for Jesus to save us from our cross. That's the soul's cry. Jesus, save me from this cross. Don't make me suffer like you did. I didn't make any of this up. How many understand that? I'm just reading the text. The soul despises appearing helpless and vulnerable and will beg Jesus for help. Don't answer this. Just think about it. Have you ever found yourself being crucified with Christ and begging him to deliver you? But then the spirit man speaks. This other man represents the spirit, your spirit, your spirit, if you'll listen, if you'll hear. The spirit man speaks and he says, do you think you're better than Jesus? Do you really believe that you should escape the cross? That's what the spirit man says. The soul says, deliver me. The spirit man says, why would you want to escape? You think you're better than this? Look what Jesus said in John 12. And Jesus answered, the, answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it. He that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. How many have ever read this scripture before? <clears throat> when you stand in God's presence, how many of you want to be acknowledged as an honored servant? How many would love it to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant? Jesus said, this will only be given, those words will only be spoken to those who follow him. The word follow means the same way. Ready? You will only enter the kingdom by way of the cross that you were called to endure. You don't get into the kingdom without the cross. No cross, no Christ. There's no anointing. The way of the master is the way of the cross. He said, if you see me, that's where my servant will be. It's the despised and rejected way because it's the way of humiliation and vulnerability. There's no confidence there and insecurities abound. But remember what David wrote in Psalm 34. The Lord is near to them that are of a broken heart. How many would sacrifice everything for the present presence of God? Remember with the translation, the present presence of the Lord abides with those who are in the place where the self is quenched, subdued, and overcome. Only on the cross is the self quenched, subdued, and overcome. I was thinking this week where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And we always thought that meant heaven. What if he meant the cross? That was right before he went to the cross. He said, I'm going, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And we always wished it was just heaven, right? We always just want to get saved and die and go to heaven. But not die young. We want to die old and healthy and then go to heaven. The present presence of the Lord abides with those who are in the place where the self is quenched, where the self is subdued, where the self is overcome. It's the place where I present myself as a living sacrifice. How many know that Jesus became that sacrifice? And we are called to the same cross. Is the cross that my soul and body despise and violently re reject 
in this weak, crossless generation, will I be one that cries out also like the malefactor on the left and says, Lord, save me from this cross. I don't want to suffer like this. I would rather go as easy and as gently as I can. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to suffer persecution. Then he said, be brave. Take courage. Take courage. And you'll be honored by my Father. Amen. Stand with me if you would.